Right, hello everybody. I'm John Atack, and uh, I'm delighted to welcome John Hunter, uh, PhD, who's going to tell us some fascinating ideas that he's pulled together in his his research. Uh, hi, John. Hi, John. Thanks so much. I'm really glad to be here, and yeah, have an opportunity to share some of what I've learned over the past couple of years. Mm. And and let's say you know my great friend and colleague Yuval Laor, um, who's appeared on this channel a number of times and is doing really leading edge research into awe and belief. Um, he is a big fan of yours. Um, he's impressed um, with the work you've done. So and he's hard to impress. So yes, and it's 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 a great compliment for me. And I, I, I think and we've kind of spoken um, sort of off camera uh, before about this, but I, I did a lot of my research kind of in isolation in, in South Africa and sort of published my PhD or my PhD was completed in, in 2017 and then only went and spoke at the, the ICSA conference last month mm. and came upon uh, Yuval. Um, and it was, it was, it was just really a, a wonderful surprise to, to hear that somebody had actually had a look at my work understood it and it kind of uh you know comes from a quite a similar perspective to to what i do um and it's also just it's there's there's a nice confirmation about it when you're doing and work in parallel with somebody else there's quite a lot of overlap and realizing that we're coming to very similar conclusions so it was it was really it was really nice for me to to hear yeah yeah i, I mean when i first met you val which was uh june 2015 in toronto he came to a seminar that I, I gave there and he said that he he had been to a fair few academic conferences and tried to get his ideas across and people would say no religion is about ritual and it's about belief or you know mythology that's what it's about it, it's, we don't we don't want to muddy things up by talking about emotions here and he came into yeah. the room with us and talked everybody he talked to knew what he was talking about because yeah. we'd had the experience or seen others had have the experience so, um, yeah, where, where would you, we're going to talk about the dopaminergic defense hypothesis, which, which sounds scary in terms of, of words, yeah, it, but it, it, really it actually isn't. isn't. I just no, want to reassure no. people it's not scary yeah. and it's quite a nice word, I think, dopaminergic, and we should all learn it and use it in sentences. Yeah, you can use it at parties. You make a lot of friends that way. That's it, yeah. Um, um, so I mean, I, I guess, and you've you've alluded to it, the the idea that 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 people are often converted to a way of of believing about something, and whether it's religion or whether it's you know something else through a a, a very profound experience is, um, as you say, something that that seems to have been ignored a lot. So that that's that conversation about ritual and that conversation about you know wanting answers. Um, it kind of assumes that there's one answer or two answers or three answers in terms of why people believe. And, and I think that there are multiple reasons. Yeah. And, you know, whether a person has, you know, a completely overwhelming sort of soul transformation to Paul type of experience, or whether they have more subtle experiences that 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 confirm what they, they believe, I think the role of emotion and these affective states in in belief formation uh, haven't really been um, explored as they as they they could be. Um, to give you and yeah, uh, maybe preempting some of the, the questions, but to kind of give you the background on, on where my interest in it began was in uh, 2003. I had a manic episode while I was living in in London, and for those that aren't really familiar with that, that's the the sort of elevated state of bipolar disorder. Mm -hmm. At the time, I didn't know what it was. And at the time, I was a Christian and I was, you know, reading the Bible a lot. And I was, uh, you know, struggling with a, with a lot of things and praying for some sort of breakthrough. So when I felt this incredible sense of euphoria and joy and confidence and um, connectedness with the uni universe and energy and productivity and my mind just working in a in a very interesting and and fast and um e excited way um i mean it really just felt i'm at the time i was 100 percent convinced that i was having a religious experience like, there was no doubt yeah. in my mind at all 
for about three months from that point, I was in this really elevated state. I, I felt like I'd undergone a, a spiritual transformation. And it was only um, as I moved from mania, as often occurs, into a very deep depression that I started to question this and kind of say, well, this maybe this isn't God. You know, I, I, I was trying to 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 hold on to that and kind of find some way to convince myself that it was an experience of God, but it was after a while it became pretty impossible to do that. And um, I mean, I, I described the depression in, in my my PhD, and and I'd encourage people to read it to understand it's not just about feeling a little bit sad. I mean, it really was being in the depths of hell for months and months and months, mm -hmm. and eventually kind of going to a, a mental health professional and saying this is what I've been going through. This is what I was thinking. These are some of the things that I was doing. Um, can you kind of give me any insights? And the psychologist who, who diagnosed me literally just opened up the DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of, of Mental Disorders, um, and showed me the page with the diagnostic kind of criteria for, for bipolar disorder, it used to be known as manic depressive disorder. And I could tick every single one of the the, the categories. It was just so clear as daylight to me. And in a way that I was very lucky about that because for a lot of people, when they're diagnosed, they, they don't accept the diagnosis. It's, it's got a lot of stigma attached to it and that sort of thing. So they'll avoid it. And if they're not sure about it, then when they feel up again, they often go off their medication because they're not convinced that they really do have um, something that needs to be managed quite carefully. So I was quite lucky about that, but from that point, I kind of said to myself, okay, well, I've, I've experienced something that I was 100% certain was a religious experience. And now I've got very good reason to think that it wasn't a religious experience, that, that it was something biochemical, something going on in my, my brain that made me think that I was having a, a religious experience. Could other people possibly not also have similar things happening to them? And they would also mistake it as, as a religious experience. Mm -hmm. And I think the response from a lot of people who haven't experienced mania would be, no, I'm not as gullible as you are. But if you read my work, you'll you'll see that I, I am capable of critical thinking. I'm relatively intelligent. I'm not particularly um, gullible. It's a very compelling experience. And the literature on, on bipolar mania is that a lot of people can't distinguish between, you know, was it a religious experience or was it a... A, a manic episode maybe it's maybelline so, um, exactly yeah but i last week i, I watched uh, an incredible democ uh, documentary about uh, kanye west or, or yay as he is yeah. more recently known and there was a, a woman who came up with him who's a, a poet and and when he was very very beginning of his career performing so she got to know him she was later they were both of them later diagnosed with bipolar and something she yeah. said, a number of things she said quite fascinated me, and he's absolutely gone, you know, and, and the, you know, sat there on Alex Jones's info wars with a black yeah. mesh mask over his face and camos on. Um, yeah. And when Alex Jones says, um, of course, we don't like Hitler, but Kanye says, I like Hitler, <laughs> sort of, you know, and he talks about Hitler's redeeming qualities. We don't find out what they are, but he was a vegetarian after all. But yeah. it was interesting to me that, that the, the woman poet said, of course, when you are in hypermania or mania, yeah. you tend to feel that that's the normal proper state. That's the state you want to be in because you feel euphoric. You feel great, you know, particularly yeah. in, in the hypermanic state. And I think what you say is, is incredibly relevant. Yuval's done a lot of work on temporal lobe epilepsy. And, and indeed, when we first met, presented me with the Bear Fedio uh, list, and, and I was able to tick off 17 of the characteristics straight away for Ron Hubbard. He, he yeah. exhibited these characteristics. And again, so many people who come to lead authoritarian cult groups, it would seem, and we can't know without meeting them and without having the expertise to diagnose them, but it, they appear to be suffering from temporal lobe epilepsy or from one of the so-called cluster B group of disorders, borderline yeah. 
um, malignant narcissism or bipolar, where you have an overlap of symptoms, and they have what they consider to be religious experiences. When uh, Berfedio first published in the 70s, um, they put forward the idea, as, as best I recollect, that Muhammad suffered from this. I'm not going to say anything about that. That's a ridiculous idea. Um, I'm not going to draw any cartoons of him either. Uh, and that St. Paul, that, you know, that conversion of Saul to Paul, as you say, was quite possibly an episode of, of temporal lobe epilepsy. And we come to this point where what appears to be supernatural is often physiological. And that takes us into you know, the work that, that you're doing. Uh, but, uh, but if you want to carry on with the progression of steps that you went through, I think that, you know, which we talked about last week, I think that'd be very useful to our audience. Sure. Um, I mean, maybe just also to comment on, on to comment on, on Kanye. Um, one of the things that you notice in, in mania is a lack of fear of consequences. And yeah. this really comes into the, the dopaminergic defense. So that sense of inadequacy and fear and shame and guilt and all the, the negative emotions that a person might have, mania is kind of the opposite of that. So yeah. where, where you might feel terrified of the consequences of you know engaging with, with somebody socially or saying something or doing something, a, a depressed person tends to withdraw a lot and be very feel like what they have to say has got no value at all. A person who's manic tends to massively overvalue their opinions and also not feel any fear of, of what's going on. And clearly there's a middle ground where you, where you want to, to be. And, and since my argument for the dopaminergic defense hypothesis is that essentially it's an, uh, an exaggerated defense. So as opposed to kind of allowing a person to feel like they're dealing with the situation, it's, um, it's it's messed with to a degree that it becomes uh, problematic and yeah so I think Kanye is a, a good example of that in terms of the the relationship between certain uh, neurological uh, disorders and and psychiatric disorders and and various uh, religious figures there's an article and I can't think of it at the moment I think it's about a 2015 article that was published I think by um, a group of researchers from from Harvard, certainly one of the, the bigger U.S. universities, and they speak about Paul, they speak about Jesus, they speak about Moses, they speak about various things, and there's limited information for them to work with, but they kind of say this sort of aligns with temporal lobe epilepsy, this kind of aligns more with schizophrenia because there aren't any moods, uh, sort of mm -hmm. symptoms uh, um, apparent here. This aligns quite a lot with mania, um, you know, particularly with with individuals who at some points are very kind of confident and very outspoken and then at times sort of withdraw for um, long periods of time that 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 kind of links up and then you're mentioning uh sort of cult leaders of of the past there's a, a great book that i read a long time ago by a psychiatrist named anthony Storr. Yeah. Um, feet of clay feet of clay yeah and fantastic book so and and he's kind of talking about I mean, he speaks about Freud, he speaks about Jung, he speaks mm. about uh, Gurdjieff, uh, Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh, mm. uh, you know, a number of different characters. But the, the link to manic depression is actually made quite explicitly in, in that, mm. that book. And you see that the, the major thing that he's arguing actually is very in line with, with my hypothesis, which is a lot of these people went through a period of intense suffering immediately prior to their transformational uh, type of of experiences, mm. so we've got that, um, you know. In research, we 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 call it transferability, where you've you've got similar things going on in in parallel sort of spaces, and um, and they help, you know. So in the journal article that I published last year, you, I'm effectively arguing that making people feel terrible for a while makes them feel better than they've ever felt before. Um, so it's useful to have these other examples. Okay, well, it's been found here as well. It's been found here as well. So it's not as as crazy as it as it may be um, sort of coming across. And and it, and it is frequently the case, you know, with with Jesus, it would be the forty days in the wilderness. Um, but we see it, you know, in the temptations of Saint Anthony. You, you, it's hard to think of 
and especially when you've seen the Hieronymus Bosch painting, it's hard to think of St. Anthony as, as sane because of the, these terrible hallucinations. And of course, many methods are used like fasting, like sleep deprivation, they're the simple ones, or, or fixated yeah. perception, which will actually induce um, altered states, let's call it, call it that, which are definitely comparable to, to states which we relate as mental illnesses and mental disorders. Yeah, and and I and I think I mean you mentioned uh, the the poet friend of of Kanye's mm. as well, and the literature on uh, bipolar disorder and creativity is really ex extensive. So, mm. what what you know to be a leader of any kind requires confidence. It, it requires some de degree of being charismatic. Certainly, certain types of of leaders. And before a person moves into a manic state where you know things are clearly problematic that hypermanic state between what's kind of considered normal and manic is a very um charismatic place to be mm -hmm. a lot of ideas a lot of you know the ability to um to use words in an, in an amazing way to convince people to 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 lead people is is really quite profound in, in that state it's only when it kind of um kind of goes over the top that it's it's uh it it becomes obvious to people that it's an issue um in fact people that are bipolar too which is people that experience hypomania and depression so they don't experience the full mania but hypomania and depression often they remain undiagnosed for you know long periods of time that the the delay between first symptoms and diagnosis for bipolar disorder too is about eight to ten years so to say that somebody could be in a different context and not have it diagnosed as being um, a problem is, you know, very plausible given the, the literature on the, the topic. Mm. And, and such people do exude confidence. And, of course, um, yeah. And it, in times of uncertainty, we tend to latch on to people who exude confidence, so usually yes. to our detriment. But um, yeah, it, it's an aspect. And that that absolute certainty in in who they are and what they're teaching with with ron hubbard that one of his critics a man called alfia hart who worked on his publications until 1954 and then left and started his own newsletter which he ran for 12 years called the abbery and he gathered together just about everybody that left dianetics or scientology all of the big names in the next 12 years would write something for the abbery which is all online for anybody who's deeply curious um, and has a lot of time to spend. Um, but one of the things that Alfie Hart said was that Elron Hubbard should actually date his revelations. So it would be, this is it, spring 1954, this is it. And that it is, as you look back through Scientology, that, that he does every few months, he says, I've found it now. So in 1950, he's promising this perfected state of humanity called the clear. And he says in, in his first book, Dianetics, the Modern Science of Mental Health, that he has cleared 272 people. None of them has ever come forward. Yep. Yeah. And looking into his letters of the time, and I've been privy to those, it's a complete fabrication. He'd perhaps dealt with about 40 people, and he'd not actually used the method that he's used in Dianetics on them. He'd used deep trans hypnosis, as I did interview people who were around him at the time. But this would it would be not until 1965 so 15 years after he's said i've got it now i've done it and every year or every six months or so he, yeah i've done it this time in 1965 he announced that he had the world's first real clear and yeah. you know who i again interviewed quite this, this time this time i've done yeah it. this yeah. time i've got it yeah. and when i asked john mcmaster who was that first real clear how what what had happened you know what his revelation was that made him clear he said i don't know uh hubbard just told me i'd done it <laughs> and yeah yeah and they still of course haven't produced the perfect human being let alone the the superhumans that, that that they but it was something within hubbard's imagination and i think it would be very easy to, to you know he definitely suffered from hypermania and he definitely suffered from profound depression i found Lots of people over the years, including John McMaster, who'd seen him in a terribly distressed state, 
but that was not um as i think it's john keats that was not the smiling public man that you know there's this yeah i mean i i i have a sense that and I, i certainly don't want to claim that you know all religious experiences um can be explained neurobiologically or that all religious leaders uh, suffer from uh, mental disorders however you know when you when you look at the 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 descriptions of of what a manic experience feels like it's very plausible that other people would interpret it as a as a religious um experience and you know it's it seems plausible that a number of religious uh, leaders might have have had bipolar disorder or temporal lobe epilepsy and may not have had the support structures around them um you know to to encourage them to be more introspective about other possible explanations for for what they were going through i can tell you that a lot of people that are bipolar think that they are either being spoken to by god or that they are god or that they are the second coming um you know and unless you've got somebody around you to to kind of push you back in the the right direction or unless you have a really profound depression that follows that that manic state that forces you to confront the possibility that maybe there's something not quite right um i can understand why people would hold on to those mm. those transformations because they are whether they are from god or whether they're from something else they're amazingly profound and they make you feel like you are transformed and i think that that's something that can't be um easily discounted no and and it it can also of course be a a positive experience as you say um people with bipolar are off you know often creative so you know robin williams or or stephen fry here both yeah um and it's you know if they become as robin williams and stephen fry did if they become stand up comedians <laughs> and write comedy then we're fine but but when they cross a line into telling us you know a philosophy yeah. of life and how to think and how to feel without having that um interception where where they 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 don't see themselves they don't they they think that the depressed state is just something that they have to go through the 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 devils yeah. they have to fight with you know as St Anthony did or you know and they justify it and it'll be repackaged we always see things from the perspective of our mood so if yeah. you ask somebody who's depressed to give you five happy memories they can't remember anything happy yeah whereas the day before they may have been perfectly able to and if yeah. you ask somebody in mania to to tell you five unhappy memories they're unlikely to you know they're it's more likely and it's that... and it's it's amazing how we can reframe negative things in a positive way so negative things that have happened we can look back on and say this was the great thing about that and likewise when we're depressed a positive thing we can say well that was just setting me up you know lulling me into a false sense of security about what life is really like and mm -hmm. yeah so it, it 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 is uh yeah it's uh it's tricky when when mood changes and actually because a lot of my research is as focused on uh, large group awareness training um I, i find that that's an issue when when research is done shortly after the trainings end to ask people you know what did you think about the training and they said it was amazing and then you because they're in this really elevated state mm -hmm. and then you ask them you know very specific things what did you think about when that trainer was screaming at that person standing a foot away from her and she was breaking down into tears and then suddenly you see them trying to kind of make a connection between this thing that objectively happened that they can actually remember and their memory of the 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 training which is that it was this amazing positive thing and it's it's astonishing to to kind of see how mood does distort our perceptions not only of of what's going on um in the present but also the past and also the the future and again when you ask people you know do you believe that you've been transformed yes i'm i'm transformed forever mm. and then you speak to them in two weeks time and they're like whoops sorry you know i i don't feel the the same the same way anymore and mm. um i think that's why research on these things has to be done in a very careful way taking these these things into consideration
Very much so. I mean, Scientology is not exceptional in, in demanding testimonials from its members yeah. while they are high, you know, immediately. And yeah. Because the techniques of Scientology are largely ways of inducing euphoria. It's that simple that, that there are, and that, you know, they are techniques that are used by some hypnotherapists and by some therapists as well, but it, to a, a different, a slightly different end. And what happens in Scientology is you will write a success story and then your next visit will be to the registrar who will sell you the next course, you know, or get yeah. you to mortgage your house to buy the next course or sell your children into slavery or, or whatever is necessary because it is that process. I, I mean, for me, looking at it, people seem to last about three days in the euph euphoric state. Yeah, or I'd say that's about right. And then the faith healing, you know, they're back in the wheelchair or, or you know, whatever. So well, with with large group awareness trainings, I mean, I think that they've they've kind of timed it quite nicely. They end on a Sunday. Their graduation slash recruitment is on the Tuesday. So that gives graduates enough time to go out and find as many people as they can, but also not too much time that the the high wears wears mm -hmm. off. And I think something that you you mentioned in your book, obviously uh, referring to Robert Cialdini's book, uh, Influence, mm -hmm. that whole idea of commitment and consistency, and Edgar Schein spoke about it as well, that the idea of the, the more public a, a commitment is, mm -hmm. the, the more it leads to behavior that's in line with that display of commitment. So that's requiring people to to sign something or to write a testimony or to give a testimony, particularly if it's public and their name is associated with it, really makes it difficult for them to unconsciously now acknowledge that there was a problem with um, with what they've been in, involved with. As soon as they've written something down, it that binds them into the process. And if they spend money, particularly a lot of money, that's also a massive public uh, commitment. And you know, large group awareness trainings do the same thing. They get participants to recruit family and friends while they're in that elevated state mm -hmm. and and in doing that you know the the obvious benefit is that these organizations are getting new participants who are trusting which is really important for their their process but the mm -hmm. the hidden benefit of it for these organizations is that the people that have just graduated are now psychologically bound because they've now committed very publicly and done something very public to acknowledge that they support these organizations for them to then acknowledge later that maybe there was something problematic about it when the high disappears um, becomes a lot more difficult to do. Yeah, I, I had a friend in, in Scientology, a, man, a poet called George Kendrick, um, and uh, lovely, just a lovely man, really loved the man. And when I left Scientology, he pointed out to me what I'd been writing when I'd been doing the upper levels of Scientology, he said, you know, you've, this is what you actually felt, you know, and, and so going to him and saying, yeah, I, I had time to think about it. And the reality is, you know, that permanent state, that idea that you've now been transformed and nothing can change you back. Well, yeah. a few days later, there you are again in the queue at the supermarket, wondering how you're going to afford the potatoes or, or yeah. you know, whatever reality is, is still there. And because we, you know, we negotiate the world um, emotionally and um, Jill Bolt Taylor, the former Harvard neurologist who had a stroke and spent oh, seven yeah. years putting her head back together and wrote a beautiful little book about it. And as she says, your know, words to the effect that, that, that we believe we are thinking creatures with feelings, but the reality is we are feeling creatures that think. And when you go yeah. a step beyond that, there's no differentiation in our minds between feeling and thinking. You know that. And when the, you when you see it, the, when, you know. when you see the neurochemistry and when you see what's going on in your brain when you are making decisions, um, that interaction is very clear as well. That link between the limbic system and the the prefrontal cortex, mm -hmm. you constantly your your thoughts are being colored by emotions uh, mm -hmm. constantly. And sometimes if the emotions are super powerful then the thoughts are being just dictated by the emotions and occasionally when we engage what 
you know Daniel Kahneman would call system two, yeah. we can put those we can put our thoughts to the forefront and quieten some of those those emotions. But you know, I, I'm I'm sure that it probably goes on in Scientology and in, and in in other groups as well. But certainly in large group awareness trainings, they do everything that they can to make sure that your prefrontal cortex is depleted you know there's what they call ego depletion your your ability to think rationally is worn out made tired and they spend a lot of time convincing you that you shouldn't trust your your thoughts you should trust mm -hmm. your heart you should trust your natural knowing you should trust your feelings so two things are going on they are making you tired they you know uh, preventing your 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 thinking from engaging and they are convincing you that the the supreme way of knowing is through some sort of experience or natural knowing. Mm. Then at the end of the seminar, they trigger this powerful emotional experience, which people then associate with the questionable, let's just say, principles and obligations that have been put forward during the the, the seminar. So, um, I mean, I don't think any of them had any understanding of the, the neuroscience of what was going on. They've just found a process that that's worked. Mm -hmm. They've borrowed from Scientology. They've borrowed from, you know, even from some mainstream psychology in, in some ways. But they've put something together, as I think a lot of um, the other groups that you've um, looked at have. It's evolution by natural selection. They found what works. Yes. And they've added things that work more. Mm -hmm. They've taken away things that work less. And those things change over time with exposure through the internet and whatever. So they've had to, you know, become a little bit more diplomatic and and smart about how they do things. But I think that that's really how um, most of these, these groups seem to have evolved. Yeah. And with the large group awareness trainings, their, their origins are partly in Scientology. Um, yeah, Bernard Earhart is quite open. Was quite open about that. Jack Rosenberg, is it? Was that his actual name? Yeah, um, and I think when you say was quite open about it, I think that that's that's a good correction because I think they were quite open in his biography. They speak about it consistently mm -hmm. in the Book of S. They mention it without any kind of sense of this is problematic. And then obviously Scientology's uh, you know, reputation has taken a bit of a hit in the last couple of decades. And then suddenly you don't hear too much about that connection anymore. And in fact, if you go onto the, his website, there's, there's a defense kind of saying that he never took anything from Scientology at all. So well, it's um, good to know that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the reassurance from a competence yeah. trickster. Um, the, I mean, the other, the other aspect, which is evident in, in Earhart seminar training in its origins is is the Zen Buddhist idea of bursting the back, having a an experience yes. that will be transformative. I seriously question that in the context of Zen Buddhism. And, and let me say I was a practitioner of Soto Zen as a teenager for a year. I learned Zazen meditation in a monastery and meditated seriously for a year and then over the years beyond. And I've come to the conclusion that that this is potentially incredibly dangerous. Um, subject when you there's a book by Brian Dyson Victoria who's a, a Zen priest who gives a history of the involvement of of the Japanese military after the Meiji Restoration which I think was 1868 somewhere around there right through the Second World War all Japanese troops daily did Zazen meditation so when John Cabot Zinn or Daniel Goleman more recently say you don't need to worry about compassion because meditation will lead to compassion. That is a massive example showing this is not in fact true that meditation, you know, people can be guided towards something negative. But that, so there's a sense of revelation that comes from there. But the other element that I see in Elgaz, um, having spent far too much of my life dipping around in this stuff, is, is what comes from the Chinese communist practice, that they're kind of abusing people head on in a group of people, the milieu control that Robert J. Lifton talks about, the hot seat, as it's called in many, many groups, where yeah. somebody is stripped down to nothing so that they can then be, you know, accommodated into the system. And of course, with the Chinese communists, that was to believe, to, to move your attachment to your family, which is 
a strong tradition in Chinese thought, much stronger than it is in the West, um, that you know the family is everything. And you're meant to move that attachment to the party, to a yeah. belief in, in Mao as a, as a parent. And, you know, and alongside that process, of course, well, in, in two years, two and a half million people were executed by Mao yeah. for, for their failure to redeem themselves. And people went through the camps. But the effect that, that those techniques had upon Scientology and, and upon Elgats and many other groups are as yet almost unstudied. We know almost there's almost nothing in Western literature, in fact, about the Chinese um, process. I recently read a book by Aminda K. Smith, which is ludicrously expensive. It cost me 70 pounds for this volume that costs five pounds to make. That's not her fault. That's her publisher's fault. But it's the only detailed study I've been able to find that gets you in you know, beyond um, what Robert J. Lifton found in, in his remarkable work or what Edgar yeah. Schein was looking at in his work and gives, I felt, a much broader social understanding of why this process was possible. Then it yeah. leaks into the West and on the tail of the Cultural Revolution in China, we have the hippies here and then we have these groups that are, are using techniques that, that seem to be, and they'll bring together some yoga techniques some a bit from here, a bit from there. So you, you actually took a, an Elgat in, uh, what was it, 2010? Yeah, 2010. And, yeah, and came to a certain realization about what the transformations were that they were promising. Yeah, I mean, I, I, maybe I will we'll swing back to this as well. I, I, I know that you've got a much stronger understanding of Zen than I do, but I do know that the form of Zen that, that Erhard was sort of practicing or following was the one advocated by Alan Watts. And and my understanding is that it was a it was known to be a distortion of the the, the original well, quite principle. quite simply what Watts studied with Daisat Suzuki. And Suzuki was an absolutely brilliant man. He was a professor of philosophy. He was not a Zen Buddhist. He was an Amida Buddhist. Uh, so a devotional, you know, you just pray to a Buddha and everything will be fine. Um, but his Brian Victoria takes him up as a specific case because in the 1930s, he was one of the leading advocates of military Zen. And, you know, so when the Nanjing massacre happened, which remains the greatest civilian massacre in all history, um, I think Genghis Khan may have matched it, but possibly yeah. 400,000 civilians were killed by the Japanese military in China, in Nanjing. And the... Zen master of the commanding officer wrote a letter to him congratulating him on this great um, show of true Buddhism to the Chinese people. So killing 400,000 people was somehow seen by a Zen master yeah. as a positive thing and, you know, just unbelievable. And I think the, you know, the contempt that the Japanese showed, you know, it, Prisoner of war, I think 40% of prisoners of war died in Japanese camps. Um, 0.02% died in British camps. Yeah. So, you know, this merciless attitude, which, which can come from a particular training. But yeah, Alan Watts, um, he's one of those interesting characters. So I read a lot of Watts as, as a young man, and, and it seemed most of it okay. And I, I was later quite shocked to read Geoffrey Masson, uh, my father's guru, um, Masson, actually uh, Paul Brunton and Alan Watts were frequent guests in his father's house. And and the thing that bothered him about Alan Watts was was how um, bullying he was towards his own wife, this enlightened Anglican vicar who had you know, become a Zen Buddhist. Yeah. So they're, they're charades. They're, they're not true Zen Buddhism. But even if they were, I have my suspicions, you know. Yeah, I mean, and and I, I certainly want to chat about my my Olga experience, but I mean, I I think that that kind of pattern of of taking something that is useful and worthwhile and distorting it also seems to be problematic. So you can say, well, it was influenced by this and this and this, but the way that it's it's used is is highly problematic. So, for example, in in large group awareness training, even though they don't acknowledge being influenced by psychology. You can see rational emotive behavior therapy, which is the sort of original form of cognitive Ellis, therapy yeah. um, by Albert Ellis. 
And Albert Ellis had the process of A, B, and C. So you've got an activating event, you've got a belief about that event, and then you've got a consequence. So A, B, C. And it's not the activating event that causes the, the consequence, it's the belief. And it was basically based on um, Epictetus, the Stoic philosopher, who said, we're not affected so much about what happens, but by interpretations of what happened so and that was in the 1950s which is well before any of the large group awareness trainings mm. came around if you look at some of the the major large group awareness trainings these days they've got something where they say there's an event and then there's a story about the event and then there's a consequence so now they don't have the belief they've got the story which is effectively exactly the same thing they're mm. using exactly the same process and there's nothing wrong with saying that you need to be responsible for the way that you interpret things and there's some agency there and it can be more empowering to look at it in a in a different way but if you see the way that they ask people to take responsibility for things and the the, the level of blame and shame and guilt and humiliation that is generated through those those interactions in a high pressure environment where you've got a person who might be standing in front of hundreds of other people it's not what you would see in psychology and although it's you know, so on paper, they're kind of doing the same thing. But if you actually look at it and you, you really evaluate it, one is done in a controlled environment. It's done in a safe way where there's a relationship of trust. The other is, I've been speaking to you for two minutes, and now I'm going to start unpacking how you should have interpreted your rape 20 years ago in front of 200 people. And you need to take responsibility for it. There's a very mm. big difference, even though on paper they are, are quite similar. Mm. So... Yeah, th that distortion of things that are useful seems to be something that runs through, again, a lot of these these groups. Yeah, um, I mean, and, and Ellis had a very good reputation as a counsellor, um, particularly with people who had marital difficulties. And um, rational emotive therapy is, is certainly uh, an origin for cognitive therapy and cognitive behavioural therapy. So it was very important. But you've got somebody who's highly trained who has your best interests at heart exactly and yeah. is in a safe environment where you can grow and develop you know I, I, there's a, um, a video that tony robbins i think has approved which amazes me where you've got he's got like two thousand people in the room or something yeah. and there's a, a young woman who has been abused and he immediately elects three members of the audience he doesn't know any of these people to be her uncles and that they will check in with her from then on and you're going but but what you know that yeah. these people he, you know they may simply perpetuate the abuse you know that he has no idea whether they're actually going to be sympathetic to her predicament or not and you see the whole group accepting this wonderful wonderful yeah. event really quite alarming but uh yeah let me let me get back to that experience in, in 2010 because i think this kind of comes to the the core of what um my research is about so from 2003 when i was diagnosed with bipolar disorder to 2010 i spent a lot of time trying to understand it it's a it can be a, a really destructive illness mm -hmm. it can ruin your life your family's life people around you you know kind of have to pick up the pieces if you're not managing yourself properly so i really wanted to to manage it as well as I could. So I, I was reading everything that I could. I was trying to understand what the triggers were for further manic episodes. That was what I was really uh, trying to understand. And the literature is quite clear. So um, three of the major triggers, environmental triggers for a manic episode are psychological stress, sleep disruption, which is actually a form of psychological stress. So it does very much the same thing in terms of um, elevations of cortisol and and that kind of thing. And then another one was goal attainment. So effectively reaching a goal or removing something stressful that you've been striving towards often leads to um, manic or hypermanic episodes. There were a couple of other things that they spoke about. So, you know, um, taking stimulants, amphetamine, cocaine, um, anti certain antidepressants, those can, uh, can possibly cause manic episodes. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that's a, a very obvious one you're going directly to that part of the brain and and elevating things so you can understand that the other one was um seasonality so in people that live in in, in climates that are very summer slash winter so not really south africa so much but 
um, probably the UK a bit more so, mm, where it absolutely. gets really cold and then it gets like a, maybe a bit a bit better. Um, then then that can trigger things. It actually, but, sometimes gets really hot here as well. Ex Not exactly. Often, so, but... but those aren't things that you can manipulate in a in an environment. So you can't go into into a training environment and manipulate seasonality really and hopefully you're not giving people drugs i mean that's a pretty um dangerous thing to do in terms of getting caught for something but when i took part in the, the large group awareness training in 2010 um you know i joined a company at the time i hadn't studied psychology i'd just been studying bipolar disorder um you know just for my for my own interest and and benefit so informally I joined a company and as part of our induction, as is often the case with large group awareness trainings, um, we were asked to take part in this personal development seminar for, for work purposes. You know, we we try to find out what it, what it's about. And as is often the case, we were told we don't want to ruin the experience. So they didn't really tell us much about what was going to be involved at all. So I, I was not really too worried about it. I, was, I, I kind of thought, well, you know, you, you would never think that what was about to happen would happen in, in any organization. It was just so bizarre. But we effectively worked a full day on a Thursday, and then we got to this training, and it started at 6 in the evening. It ended at about 2 in the morning, and we were given homework on top of that. Mm -hmm. Next day, same thing. So worked a normal day on Friday. Then the, the course started at 6 in the evening, finished at 2 in the morning with homework, Saturday started at nine o'clock in the morning, finished at 12 o'clock that night with homework. And then Sunday um, was the, the sort of more relaxed day. So we started at 10 in the morning. So they allowed us to sleep a lot more positive on the final day. And it finished at about six or seven, I think, in the, the evening with the graduation and that sort of thing. But the first three days were horrifically um, psychologically abusive. So a lot of screaming by this trainer, a lot of exercises where people had to share painful experiences. And then they were told effectively that they were responsible for anything that had happened to them. There were regression exercises where participants were asked to think about painful memories from their pasts. Um, there were dyadic exercises, which I understand are used in Scientology as well, where you sit knee to knee with somebody, you look into each other's eyes, you don't break eye contact for long periods of time. Um, my interpretation of what was going on over that those four days was that the exercises, almost without exception, were designed to generate as much guilt, shame, inadequacy, humiliation as possible. And people mm -hmm. were breaking down constantly. Mm -hmm. Between the exercises, there were often um, exercises that kind of relaxed you. So guided visualization to kind of relax you and then there would be something that kind of stressed you out again pretty much immediately afterwards so somebody who knows that psychological stress and sleep disruption are major triggers i was sitting there very very cautious and very much again engaging what kahneman would call system two i wasn't drifting into that um, system one emotional state i was very much watching what was going on and and my only goal was to not have a relapse you know, I, you know, I, I didn't want to lose this job. I had a home to pay off in Johannesburg. So I was trying to kind of figure out how to manage this, but there's not really time to, to kind of do that in that environment. So I just wanted to kind of get through it, try to be as stable as I, as I could and, and then make any big decisions afterwards. But so for three days, I was like, this is massive psychological stress and then sleep disruption and then on the final day, it was the clearest kind of case of goal attainment I'd ever seen. You know, the, 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 the mood was switched from one of being incredibly oppressive to one of being love, acceptance, affirmation, joy. You've graduated. You're wonderful. You're one of us. So, you know, as I've said, what Robert J. Lifton would call dispensing of existence. Mm -hmm. the, the person running the environment said to, to the people there, you are now people. You've gone from non-people to people through your confessions. And that sharing of experience was very much like um, what you would see in, in confessionals, um, you know, in the, 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 the communist uh, reformation camps. Um, 
And so that pattern of the, the triggers of mania was very clear to, mm. to me. Um, additionally, we had been promised a certain experience at the end. So our chairman had said to us, you're going to have the greatest day of your life. And as somebody who'd been manic before, I was sort of wanted to say to him, well, I've been, <laughs> I've had a pretty good day um, as, you know, bipolar being the, 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 the extreme of elevation and, and mood. But what I saw amongst, almost without exception, the, part, the participants that were there was what I would describe as hypermanic symptoms. Mm -hmm. So not full mania, but really euphoric, laughing, smiling, dancing, super confident. Mm -hmm. People said to me afterwards that they had slept two hours the night before and they felt amazingly energized, which is just very kind of clear. I'd also heard before the training from people at the organization of people who had been divorced immediately after participating, which is very impulsive. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I thought that seems a little bit strange. And I'd only really made the connection afterwards. But after doing the, the training, so I'd noticed that the, the triggers were present and that the symptoms were present. And that was obviously very fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. I then went and I spoke to you know, a number of uh, psychology professors and psychiatrists and various people and tried to explain to them what I thought was was going on, which is effectively the what I published in my PhD seven years later. But I was I had a business degree and I had bipolar disorder. So in terms of somebody to trust on these things, I wasn't really high on their list. Um, and I was kind of just dismissed. And so I spent a lot of time looking into it. So from about 2010 to 2013, I was on discussion boards. There was a, there's a website called rickross.com. It's now called culteducation.com. And a lot of people share their experiences of, um, of whatever groups they've been in. So they can share their experiences anonymously. And at the time, I think there were 17,000 or 19,000 posts under the section called large group awareness training. And I just read through all of them. And with the lens that I had, it was just clear that people from around the world were going through seminars that were almost identical to what I went through. And I mean, really, the lack of creativity amongst these different organizations is quite startling. Um, but huge amounts of psychological stress, the sleep disruption varied from organization to organization, but it certainly seemed to be very common. Mm. And then the graduation, so that the triggers were always there. And then people would talk about how they felt afterwards. And obviously, when people are writing about their experiences, it's not like you're sitting with them as a mental health professional and saying, okay, did you also experience X, Y, and Z? And you're trying to kind of understand the cluster of things that they were talking mm -hmm. about. But without any prompting, people were talking about elation, euphoria, people talking about divorces, just unbelievably frequently. And in fact, a lot of the organizations themselves release statements saying, you know, you'll become more decisive is the word that they like to use. So whether it's, you know, making a big change in your life or getting a divorce or, mm -hmm. you know, changing your profession, you'll have the courage to do it. But what you actually see is very clear, impulsive behavior, huge levels of energy and productivity. And these are things that are, are spoken about not only by participants, but by family members of participants that have noticed something drastically different in their, their, their loved ones and by the organizations themselves. So when these things can be framed in a positive way, you know, energy, productivity, um, sociability, confidence, um, you know, a more positive perspective of the, the world, creativity. These are all things that are being promised by these organizations, which happen to all align with the, the symptoms of, of hypomania yeah. and mania. Then when you look at some of the negative effects of, of participation that have been claimed since the, the, the inception of these organizations in the early 1970s, and there were a number of articles that were written in the 1970s and 1980s about people experiencing psychosis, being diagnosed as schizophrenic or bipolar after taking part. Um, you see... In 1987, there was an article written by Morton Lieberman, and his comment was, you know, there's no reason to assume on the basis of the evidence we've so far been able to gather that large group awareness training could not create psychiatric, 
psychiatric risk in some. What is clearly lacking, however, is a coherent theory to explain the relationship between what takes place in the trainings and these symptoms. So at the time, they weren't they they had noticed that there were these things going on, but but they were kind of like there's no way to really explain how they are related. And this is where my mm -hmm. hypothesis comes comes into it. So understanding that these that these seminars involve the the triggers for bipolar disorder, hypermania, and mania and the symptoms for the vast majority of participants, I started to look at some of the major neurobiological theories for, for bipolar disorder. One of the, the very common ones is the dopamine hypothesis of bipolar disorder. Um, I don't know if I should explain a little bit about dopamine for... I, I think you probably listeners. should, because there will be members of the audience who are not familiar with neurochemistry. Oh, okay, so, and and I'm I'm not a, a neuroscientist, so I... I work across social psychology, a bit of neuroscience, a bit of abnormal psychology. So I'll explain it in a way that makes sense to me, and I'm sure that it will make sense to anyone else. And I, I also lecture undergraduate students, so hopefully I can explain this in a relatively um, simple way. But but basically the way that our brains operate is that we've got um, 90 billion odd neurons, which are these brain cells, and these neurons communicate with each other by sending electrochemical messages. So effectively what happens in each of these, um, these brain cells is that a, 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 an electrical impulse builds up. And when that impulse reaches a certain threshold, then it tells that brain cell to send a message to another brain cell. Um, that message that it sends, the brain cells don't touch each other. So there's a gap between them. And so in order for this brain cell to communicate with this one, it has to send a chemical across. So the elect electrical sig signal builds up here. Eventually, it reaches a point where it says, OK, send something across to this brain cell over here. And that little chemical is called a, a neurotransmitter. And there are a number of different neurotransmitters. There are less than 200 have been discovered. But one of the major ones that we often hear about is, is dopamine. So it's just a name of, of, a, of a particular neurotransmitter or, or or chemical a messenger and, chemical in the brain along yeah. with with serotonin which which yeah people have heard about as well yeah so serotonin uh, noradrenaline or norepinephrine if you're from the us and dopamine are the three neurotransmitters that are often targeted by antidepressant medications so if you if you hear of like uh, ssri it's a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor but a lot of the antidepressants either target dopamine, serotonin, or noradrenaline, or some combination of, of, of those three. And they are supposed to have some sort of impact on, on mood, although it's a lot more complicated than um, I think it was, was believed initially. Yeah, um, I mean, there, there was a meta-analysis about a, about a year ago of serotonin, which suggested that, that it, it is absolutely a lot more complicated than Eli Lilly and other manufacturers of SSRIs would, would have us believe. Yeah, um, I don't think that the pharmaceutical companies have always got the, the, the best interests of everyone at, at heart. I think uh, a clear marketing uh, strategy is often um, prioritized over the, the truth and the complexity of, of well, things. I, I think if you've spent a, you know, a thousand million dollars bringing a chemical to market, you, you probably really need to sell it. And with um, SSRIs right at the beginning, around about 91, there was a question about, you know, were they really causing reuptake of serotonin? Yeah. Um, or were we talking about other effects? And the effect of neurogenesis of the creation of new brain cells came along at about the same time. And it could well be um, that uh, the hippocampi uh, in the limbic system are actually able to grow because of some nurturing aspect of Prozac and the various other SSRIs. And at the same time, there was research showing that, that people with profound depression usually had shrunken hippocampi. So, yeah. you know, there's, there is this other, but what we do know is, is that there are, that there are neurotransmitters. And as you say, less than 200 of them have been discovered. So you're, you're dealing with incredibly, this isn't like a computer where you've got ones and zeros. You've got yeah. an incredible signaling system going on in there. And yeah. So, I mean, the level of 
of what's going on is you've got about 90, 90 billion neurotransmitters, each communicating with on average about a thousand other uh, uh, brain cells. So there's trillions of these signals being sent around all the time. And in light of what we just sort of said, there, there is this theory called the dopamine hypothesis of, of bipolar disorder. And again, it is a hypothesis. It hasn't been confirmed, but there's a lot of reasons for thinking that it, it may be true. And, and essentially what the, the hypothesis is, is that an elevation of dopamine in a particular part of the brain is responsible for hypermanic and manic symptoms. Mm. Um, and by, by responsible, I mean, contributes relatively significantly to hypermania and mania. Obviously, there's a lot more other things going on. And a depletion of dopamine is, is associated with depression. And there's a lot of different information that can kind of support that and kind of uh, create an argument for it. For example, if you give a normal person amphetamines, which elevate dopamine in that part of the brain, you start seeing uh, symptoms that look very similar to hypermanic symptoms. If you give somebody levodopa, which is a precursor to dopamine, you can't actually give somebody dopamine. It doesn't cross the, the blood brain barrier. So you have to give people something called liver, levodopa um, or L-dopa. So for example, Parkinson's uh, disease is associated with a breakdown of the neurons that produce uh, dopamine. So often they're treated with levodopa and often people with Parkinson's when they're given levodopa might be elevated into what looks like a hypermanic or manic uh, sort of state. Um, there is some uh, functional brain imaging studies that that seem to uh, confirm this, this hypothesis and a, and a very interesting couple of case studies the unfortunate people that happen to have Parkinson's disease and bipolar disorder, which I wouldn't wish on, on anyone, but there've been cases where when these individuals who are struggling with their, their motor movement, because dopamine operates in the Negro striatal uh, uh, pathway, as well as in um, the mesolimbic pathway. So the mesolimbic pathway has got more to do with mood and affect and that sort of thing. And the Negro striatal pathway is kind of right next door and it's got to do with movement. And that's the pathway that seems to be heavily affected in, in Parkinson's disease. But these individuals that have got both of these disorders or both of these conditions, if they're having a, a manic episode, they've noticed that in some people, the, the, the movement improves. So while the person is manic, suddenly the, the movement improves, which mm. is a very strong indicator because we know that the movement is affected by, by dopamine by dopamine. Mm. So if suddenly the person's manic and we think that it's because of an elevation in dopamine and the movement improves, then that's a, a, you know another piece of evidence that, that suggests that, that dopamine's involved. But yeah. it's, it does get quite a bit more complicated. And again, in the same way that we've been speaking about antidepressants, I don't want to make any 100%, this is definitely true, but that's the starting point of my, my, my theory. So Understanding that dopamine is responsible for these elevated states, I started to look into the relationship between these LGAT conditions, these large group awareness training conditions, and dopamine elevation. And what I found was psychological stress, particularly short-term psychological stress that a person believes that they're going to be able to escape from, so leads to an elevation in dopamine. So if you put an, an animal or a human through something that's psychologically stressful, dopamine elevates in the mesolimbic um, pathway. Okay, so that was the one part. The second part is that if you stress a, a, an, a person out, the dopamine system becomes more sensitive to reward. So effectively, the, the dopamine system is often involved in processing reward. That's often what we think of when we think of the dopamine system. But... Not only is, is dopamine elevated when you're stressed, but also the system is now looking around for something rewarding. And if something rewarding happens, it responds in, in a more extreme way than it would if there hadn't been something stressful beforehand. And then finally, we know very well that the dopamine system responds to, to reward. So if something rewarding happenings, happens, uh, dopamine elevates. So what you've got now in large group awareness training is you've got a huge amount of psychological stress, the sleep disruption, which is also associated with an elevation in dopamine, but that all also makes the dopamine system more sensitive to reward. And then you've got this massively rewarding experience that happens. And so 
to me, this seems like a perfect recipe to generate a, um, a, a dopamine high. Mm. If you look at the symptoms of an elevation in dopamine, and a very good resource for this is a book called The Archaeology of Mind by Yark Panksepp yep. and Lucy Biven. So Panksepp is often considered the father of effective neuroscience. So he wrote a book called, um, I think called Effective Neuroscience. And The Archaeology of Mind, which is still a relatively dense book, is the version written for people like me who are maybe not as as literate on, on you know, very heavy uh, neuroscience. Mm -hmm. um, but when you, he speaks about seven effective systems, so seven emotional systems in, in people. One of them is called the seeking system. And this is the system that's got to do with finding things for our motivation, for our drive, that's that kind of thing. And it's heavily driven by, by dopamine. Mm -hmm. So when dopamine's elevated, then the system kicks into gear and he describes what an elevation in dopamine looks like. And what does it look like? It looks like euphoria, joy, things seeming more important than what they are. So salience is, is elevated, confidence, energy, productivity. And if you act, activate the system too much, what happens? Psychosis. And if you overactivate the system for too long, what do you get? Depression. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the, the wide range of effects that have been reported about large group awareness uh, training participation, all of the you know positive effects that they call transformation align almost identically with the effects of, of seeking arousal or dopamine elevation. And even the negative effects that have been claimed in terms of psychosis, diagnoses of schizophrenia, uh, diagnosis of bipolar disorder, et cetera. Those all align with a massive elevation of dopamine or a depletion mm -hmm. of dopamine. And again, it's simplistic to say that dopamine explains everything. It certainly doesn't, but it provides a, a very good explanation for a lot of what is going, going on. Just to, to kind of give you two examples of, of some other things that, that could be going on. We also know from, from more recent studies now that psychological stress or psychosocial stress um, elevates endorphins. Mm. Um, we also know that it elevates oxytocin. Oxytocin is a lot to do with bonding to, you know, so the use of stress in problematic groups, a lot of that may have to do with the fact that people feel like they need to bond in order to feel um, safe to deal with uh, the environment. Endorphins are a natural or an internal painkiller and pain, whether it's psychological or physical is dealt with in a very similar way. So endorphins are going to be produced to make you feel like you can deal with things. The thing about dopamine in the seeking system, which is so useful is that it makes you feel like you can deal with anything. That's what mania feels like. So the sense of, of feeling like if you're in an environment and you're being made to feel inadequate and ashamed and guilty and afraid, a substance that your body might produce to make you feel the opposite of all of those things, it makes sense that, that your body would produce uh, something like that. And again, just to maybe make a draw a metaphor that's, that's easy for people to understand, drugs like cocaine and crystal meth, they elevate dopamine. That's their mm -hmm. primary thing that they do. Also serotonin and, and noradrenaline, but they're mainly targeting dopamine in that same pathway. And when mm -hmm. people take those drugs, they feel a sense of confidence, of certainty, of, you know, I can deal with, with mm -hmm. things. So if our bodies have evolved to allow us to deal with heat and cold and, you know, all of these physical challenges, you know, we've got the fight or flight response that helps us uh, to prepare for physical challenges. Mm -hmm. it, it makes sense that we would have also evolved to help us to deal with psychological challenges what goes on in a large group awareness training is a very abnormal environment so you put into a state where you're being challenged in a way that you wouldn't normally be 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 challenged and it's not the same as everyday work i know work can get very stressful your entire sense of self is being um, challenged in these environments additionally what's going on in these environments is that your access to your other regulatory mechanisms your other homeostatic mechanisms are being shut down mm -hmm. so for example your ability to get up and walk out whenever you want to is very very strongly discouraged if not prohibited in some of the environments mm -hmm. 
your access to food is very limited. So often the sessions last for two or three hours. You've only got water. The chairs are not comfortable. That's problematic. One of our major defenses as, as humans is, um, you know, social support. All of us know what it's like to be going through something difficult and we go and we speak to somebody and, it, and we, feel, we feel a bit better. What happens in a large group awareness training is that you, are, you, you sit down, you're next to somebody that you don't know. They say, sit next to somebody you don't know. After every break, you have to sit next to somebody new. You can't develop any sense of, of support while you're, in that, um, mm-hmm. while, that, while you're in that environment. So if you think of kind of a scale with the challenges on one side and your defenses on the other side, a lot of your normal defenses are diminished. And so what has to happen in order for you to kind of stay in balance is for this internal mechanism to kind of, you know, do the heavy lifting. Mm -hmm. And my argument is that dopamine plays a big role in that. We know that the literature shows that it's elevated under these circumstances, but it also makes sense that it would be elevated under those circumstances because that's how brains work. Our brains don't kind of go, oh, I'm only going to use that chemical for this thing over here Mm -hmm. if it realizes that this will be useful in the circumstance it's going to bring it into into play Mm. absolutely and and you're mentioning the fight or flight fight flight freeze and some people say fawn that that mechanism what what is happening then because you have fight or flight is that you're producing adrenaline and your blood is moving out into your muscles from your organs, and thusly the butterflies in the tummy sensation. Um, and on the back of that, you're releasing endogenous morphine and in, in endorphins, internal morphine, which yeah. it functions, it fits the same receptors in the brain that um, diamorphine or heroin will fit. Um, and you also you'll get the, the muscles being ready to fight or flee yeah and this on the back of that you're having the painkiller delivered just in case and so people often if they come out of combat they won't have felt anything when yeah. they were were injured uh, mm-hmm. because their their system was so drenched it, with endorphins i think the other thing that that what you're saying stimulates in me is that while dopamine won't be the only thing that's happening it may well be a marker for everything that's happening. And so yeah. as it's something that, that is to some degree measurable, then the, the other chemistry that comes along with it, we, we can find out more about. But I, I think that, I, I think what you're saying is revelatory, really, that, that it, it's such an important idea that, that by overloading stress, you can get somebody to produce more dopamine and then by pulling the stress away and giving them a reward the dopamine will be released in and the system your system will be drowned you know your brain will be marinating in in dopamine and so you'll be incredibly high and incredibly susceptible to persuasion because all strong emotional states make us more manipulable make us you know less cool less rational well, I mean, I, in, in terms of some of the symptoms of, of hypermania and mania, just excessive spending is one of them. So to put somebody in that state where you make bad decisions with money, I mean, that's the, if, if you're running some sort of organization who wants to take advantage of people, then that is the ideal state you want people in. Mm-hmm. If you could get people to walk into your store and have them manic, they would buy 10 times as much of everything that they needed they would think they would see some trinket that think it was the most interesting thing in the world. And they'd buy 30 of them and they'd hand them out to, to people outside. I mean, it really does uh, distort your sense of what is important and it distorts your ability to kind of budget. And it's a huge problem. And again, you see this in the, in the, the participants of, of large group awareness trainings, just saying, you know, my, my husband got so upset because I just ran up, tens of thousands of dollars of debt on the credit card or my my wife doesn't want to speak to me anymore because I did this and this and this and these really bad decisions are are made and if you don't understand where they're coming from I mean in my PhD I, there's a there's a a woman who's who's posting on that website and she's talking about how she wrecked her her marriage 
And I think as an outsider, you kind of go, well, you know, you're responsible for that. But, you know, if, if you don't know what, what mania is like, um, if you don't if you don't understand what the signs are, if you don't have a support structure around you who's able to kind of, you know, give you a nudge and say, hold on a second, something's not quite right, you can do really problematic things. And I mean, I've studied this now. Uh, my PhD is on bipolar disorder and these 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 seminars. I had a manic episode in 2020. So and with all of the insight that I had, all of the 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 preparation I'd done so that I would be okay, I still did things that I I you know that I regret doing. Mm. And so when you see people coming out of these uh yeah, you see pe people coming out of these seminars and just doing things that wreck their lives and they don't know why they've done it. And it's just, it's really, really, it's heartbreaking to, to see, you know? Mm. I, I I mean, I'm this, this last month deeply engaged in research into the Charles Manson group, cult, family. And I've just, just read um, Tex Watson, Charlie Tex Watson's book. Now he was, the lead in the Tate and the LaBianca murders. Yeah. Uh, Manson was not in the room. And the book is a revelation, I think, because he, you're saying, you know, he's, he was, uh, he did extraordinarily well in school. He was an athlete. He, he went to college. Everything was trucking along nicely. He worked in a shop selling wigs and everything was going along nicely. And then he started to take, um, various chemicals and, you know, what drugs people take is up to them. But there are certain drugs that are seriously poisonous. And it started out with him taking hallucinogens, particularly LSD. And it did something to his state of mind that was not good for him. And then he became dependent upon Charlie Manson. He twice left Manson but, and went back of his own accord. And his description of you know, he is completely, he, he feels nothing during the murders, nothing at all. And afterwards, there's no remorse. He, he, he doesn't feel anything. Now, he's also along the way taken a drug called Datura. Yeah. And here we are into really serious territory, this, this drug. Part of the reason that I'm researching this is because I'm shocked that the books I'm reading, apart from Watson himself and Manson, they both mention this drug. They misname it. They call it Belladonna which is deadly nightshade, which doesn't grow in that part of the world, but maybe a local name for it, I don't know. What they were using is jimson weed or loco weed. And this creates a seriously altered state. I mean, Watson said he was tripping for 10 days the first time he took this, and he was picked up on the street in Van Nuys, California, uh, among a, a group of school children. He was crawling along the floor on his hands and knees going, Beep, 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 beep. He'd been pushed into this state. What is fascinating to me is seeing this very lucid description of the years following and how he came to understand what he'd done and the severity of what he'd done. And in a, a manic state, as you say, you don't understand the consequences. The, the reality of what's happening is different to the normal perception of reality. The interpretation of yeah. what is happening is quite different, you know, to 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 what you would think and feel if you're in a normal. And it's state. it's it's hard to kind of communicate as well when because when you say you don't understand the consequences, I think if you had to speak to somebody, they would understand what was going to happen most probably, but still interpret it in a in a way that was was positive, and and that's the the kind of strange thing. So it's not about. I've I've got no idea that X, Y, and Z will will happen. It's it's often just a, a a strange distortion of the way that you you see it. It's it's very difficult to communicate. Yeah, and and in in Tex Watson's case, of course, this is all enclosed within the idea that any minute now, the war between the races is going to start helter skelter, as Manson called it, because. Apparently, nobody in the Manson family knew what a helter skelter was. And I can remember them from my early childhood, these strange um, 
elaborate slides that you'd be sat on a coconut doormat and 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 down you go I, I don't remember going on one but i do remember seeing them and so they they had no idea what it was and so they just attached it as this term and they were going to go to in death valley where there was the bottomless pit as manson called it where they would live underground eating fruit from 12 different trees each one of which you know fruited in a particular and they no idea that you can't actually grow trees underground they need light you know there are certain simple equations here so to watson the consequence was going to be that he was kick-starting helter skelter and soon enough they'd be off in the desert and then the black race would win this war and then realize that they needed charlie manson to lead them uh, who believed himself to be of course the reincarnation of jesus the second coming yeah. the son of man man's son uh, which actually wasn't his birth name but we won't get into that but so there is this story this mythology this cosmology in which this exists where the consequence will be that we will rule the earth rather than the consequence being what really happened which is that watson spent the rest of his life in prison and died yeah. there um so yeah that how what reality is and how we perceive it you know can be enormously different things and that shifting of reality by um pushing somebody down or lifting them up in Scientology we were taught drills to make people feel better or to make people feel worse and I was never willing to practice anything to make somebody feel worse yeah and somehow that was acceptable for nine years but and I, I and think some, you can do it you know I mean I, I think something um something really insidious about certainly large group awareness trainings, but I'm sure a lot of the other groups as well, is that they, they're they taking advantage of conscience. So they're, they're, they're using the fact that people care, the, peop the fact that people yes. have got empathy. They, they, they're using the fact that people want to be better. They, they don't like having done negative things. They don't like you know the guilt and the shame and all the things that we have because we have consciences and etc those are the things that are being harnessed by by a lot of these groups so you know i've i've said it before but i mean if you if you sent somebody into one of these these groups and they were a complete sociopath it the the processes wouldn't work on them because you've you've got to care about that person that's being torn apart by by the leader you've got to care about the person sitting next to you that's breaking down into tears because something that's been said has obviously uh, affected them uh, so much so that's that seems to be a, a particularly sick thing is that it's it's people that are that are that are wanting to do the right thing as as people and often in groups it's their idealistic nature as well so they they want to do something good for the world and that is what's being harnessed to, to motivate them to uh to participate and to recruit other the people is because they they do have a, a sense of the world could be better i can be a part of making the the world better and i don't really understand maybe everything but i'm i'm going to do what i can to to to, to make that happen and mm. yeah i mean I, I just think that that's a very yeah sad element of of what a lot of these groups are doing very much so i mean i you know as i was coming out of scientology 40 years ago now i realized that that there were two groups that i could identify very readily in scientology one was salespeople, that it was very attractive to confidence strictors and scam artists and i i met yeah. a fair few over the years um you know people you had to count your fingers after you shook hands with them just to make sure and the other group were idealists there were people like myself seekers is, is a word that's used sometimes but i'm not sure that that's effective because what what happened and i think why there was such a great explosion in in the late 60s was there was a realization that you know peace and love was not going to descend upon us that that you know, the days of rage in Chicago or the Sabon sit-in, that things got violent very quickly and that the establishment was very powerful. And there was a sense 
in the US with the Vietnam War, for those who knew about it here, about the war in Malaysia and Borneo, that the, the state had been, or, or what had happened in Kenya under, under you know, with the British troops there and the horrible events that were happening in the 60s. So there was this sense that the culture was corrupt and perverse and idealistic young people, intelligent idealistic young people wanted to change that, wanted to do something. And along comes, you know, somebody like Rajneesh or Hubbard or Sun Myung Moon yeah. offering the certainty that will lead to the salvation for the whole world. The reality yeah. being absolutely the opposite of that. And so a lot of young people who could have contributed significantly to the world actually became entrapped in these systems of providing followers and money to, yeah. to the leaders of, of these terrible groups. Hum. Well, the, the lights are going to go out in Johannesburg soon. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, Unfortunately, we have this thing called load shedding. So, you know, we just get a, we get a schedule every day and we get told this is when you're not going to have any power. So organize your life around that. So yeah. I actually live on a road that is, uh, that has a, an ESCOM building on it, which is our, our national um, power supplier. So for a long time, I wasn't getting any of this load shedding, but they seem to have caught on to it now. So you. yeah, yeah, getting it. Okay. Is, is there anything you'd like to say in winding up? I, I think it's been an incredible discussion for me. I've learned no, I mean, so I, I, I really just appreciate it, John. I mean, I, I think it's, it's amazing that there are people like your, yourself around, as, as I said to you before we spoke in South Africa, I have felt quite isolated, you know, trying to um, connect up with, with various people, just trying to, you know, get feedback on, on various things. And I, this is so helpful to to me i hope i'm I'm hoping that it's helpful to some of your listeners i'm sure as well. it will be yeah um i'll I'll make all of my my research available to to everyone i'll i'll send um uh my presentation i think will be available from the the first of of october that's quite a nice short thing that people can watch um my phd is quite long but it is there's a lot of information in there. I think for anyone that's that's been through a, a large group awareness training and is maybe wondering about why they experienced it differently to everyone else. And I think that the, the people that are trying to find out about um, large group awareness trainings, it's often a family member or friend that saw mm -hmm. something problematic in, in a loved one or it's somebody that went through and because these processes work, the majority of people walk out of them thinking they've had an, an amazing experience and don't think twice about it. It's the person that's maybe sitting there thinking a little bit more critically and going, there's a lot of problematic things going on here. And they're wanting to understand how they were, you know, th that idea of social proof mm. is a, a very powerful oh, yeah. thing. When you're the only person in a room, um, you know, thinking that something is is problematic it, it feels strange. It, it's, it's alienating. So I think it, it can be very useful for people that are, are wondering about things to, to read through my research and, and realize, yeah, maybe get a bit of confirmation in terms of um, some of the, the skepticism that they, that they had. Yeah. And, and people who've come away from, from the training and, you know, and may have felt ecstatic and exuberant about it for a while and then collapsed uh, what in Scientology is called a roller coaster, because yeah. it's a normal effect. It's something you'll you'll see a lot of f for anybody doing that and realizing absolutely that you're not alone. You're not the only person who's had this experience. Many years ago, I had a call from um, a psychotherapist who had gone on a course in um, reevaluation co-counseling, um, a system um, sold by a man called Harvey Jackins that was used by the Open University here, the largest university campus in the world, yeah. for more than 20 years, despite my protests that what it was was in fact Dianetics. Yeah. Hubbard. Eventually, the Open University stopped doing it because Jackins was accused of sexual abuse, just as Werner Erhardt was accused of sexual, yeah. sexual abuse. Uh, but they wouldn't listen to me sort of saying, but it's actually probably damaging to a lot of your students doing this. It's yeah. not a tested psychotherapeutic system at all. But this woman phoned me up and she, she had a master's degree. She was a counselor. And 
she was crushed because she'd gone into this course and straight away said, this looks like Ron Hubbard's Dianetics. And the rest of the group were just like, you know, shut up. We want to, we want yeah. to learn stuff. And the effect there's, there's it had very on much that profound. sense of don't, don't spoil our fun. And you see yeah. it actually, there's an article by Harkin and Adams in 1983, that did the life spring mm. training and Richard Adams, you know, he he protested against some of the, some of the things. I mean, somebody had a psychotic breakdown in the middle of the training, and he kind of said, "Well, maybe we need to have a look at this." And the other people that were there, and my guess is that they were well educated, smart people, because that was the demographic of people going there. They basically told him, "You know, shut the hell up. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, you're coming from your head. Don't like you know, come from your heart. Don't come from your head." These sorts of things. So all the things that they'd kind of been taught to say, but it was very much a case of you are you are casting doubt on this experience that, that we're having and we're not going to have anything of it. And it takes a huge amount of courage to be in that environment and to actually speak up and say, you know, I disagree with with what is is happening. That I think it's it's massively underestimated just how powerful that social influence is. Mm. Yeah. I, I mean, certainly when I I left Scientology because I believed in Scientology and I believed that m malevolent forces had taken it over. And that's why I left. Yeah. And I, be I found myself at the middle of you know, about half the membership left at that time around the world. And I found myself at the middle of, of a, an independent Scientology movement. And then my belief faded because I suddenly had access to a lot of material about Hubbard that had been kept from us and realized that he was a liar. And therefore, couldn't trust him, couldn't trust anything he said. And for me, the the greatest shock was sitting down and because I was in the middle of this thing three or four months in, and I stopped believing, but all the people around me, these yeah. friends I have, tens of people that I was dealing with, they absolutely believe. And showing them straightforward, simple evidence, you know, a point, mm. a place where Hubbard said he was a war hero, and another place where he said he wasn't for example, or they yeah. would find a justification immediately to dismiss that yeah. the cognitive dissonance was was overwhelming. And that for yeah. me was a really strange place to arrive, you know, and it would have been easy and probably sensible looking back for me to walk away at that point and not carry on. But there is, you know, I'm stubborn. And, and so it, it was sort of, there must be a way of getting this over. And I stayed at the middle of that movement because they needed my, um, my help in court cases, my help in protecting them from harassment because I'd come to understand what was happening. And so it was a very strange relationship, these people who ultimately would turn on me and try and tear me to pieces. But if you're the, you know, you're the white crow, you're the, the one that's different, yeah. through your beliefs then black crows will kill white crows it's that simple yeah um so so yeah the, to you know to go against the flow to kick against the bricks to to stand up against this and it is good to know that there are you know in fact thousands and thousands of people who've escaped the you know, millions of people who've escaped the influence of these groups it's disappointing in, in my experience, to find that so many people don't fully integrate the experience, don't really fully understand what's happened to them, and they still hanker after the camaraderie of the, the training or, you know, being in that wonderful group without understanding that what they were part of was something that was psychologically destructive, um, you know, and often a form, in fact, of, of enslavement. I mean, it's... Uh... And we're we're going to switch off in a minute or two, but um, yeah. the the thing that I've I've found disturbing uh, over time is is when I've engaged with people that are are supporters of large group awareness training. Um, as you say, just just asking them to consider some of the negative effects. It's it's literally like they they won't they just won't acknowledge. Mm. You know, you you can say to them just don't use my research, just go onto the internet and just start looking, looking around. I mean, it's just everywhere. Mm. It's just every single, if you type in the name of your organization or any of the other organizations, you'll find the same stories 
over and over and over again from people from different parts of the world, different trainings, you know, you know, different years apart, decades apart, the same things are coming up over and over and over again. Um, and there's just no acknowledgement that that harm could ever happen. Um, it's it's quite bizarre. And in fact, you know, thinking about it from a research perspective, that whole idea of, of cognitive of cognitive dissonance, it would be interest, really interesting to do an experiment where you give, you know, information which shows that an individual is clearly doing something problematic without the name and then with the name to supports of a particular group because they're mm. capable of it, you know? So yeah. a person who's an S supporter can look at Ron Hubbard and go, this guy was a charlatan, no problem at all. And, and vice versa. So it's not that they're incapable of critical thinking. They're incapable of critical thinking in a very specialized area in the, in the area that that's important to them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's a, it's a vital point that, that, um, there are a number of people in this field, and some of them estimable, like um, Bill and Lorna Goldberg, for example, uh, highly estimable people who still believe that that by fixing people's critical thinking, you will these problems will go away. I I haven't believed that. For, I've never believed that be, because my critical thinking was in pretty good shape at the age of nineteen when I met Scientology. You know, I could have argued the back legs off Socrates probably. Yeah. But my emotional need outweighed that so that, in fact, my capacity uh, for thinking came into the service of my emotional need. And, and I yeah. would justify and intellectualize anything. I, I've often said that, that we use the full weight of our intelligence to buttress our stupidity. And certainly yeah. that that's my way of life. You know? Well, this has been absolutely wonderful. And, and yeah. we will, I hope, get together again maybe in a couple Fantastic. of months time and uh, do some more. Fantastic. Thanks so much, John. Um, yeah, I look forward to to keeping in touch. I'm nearly finished with your book and I'll, I'll give you some feedback as soon as I've done that as well. Hi, John here. Thanks for watching. We'd appreciate it very much if you'd click like as well as subscribe and click the bell for notifications. Every dollar helps and we welcome new patrons on Patreon. Or you can make a one-off payment with any currency through PayPal. Thanks so much.